Hi, everyone. I know it's been a fairly long day, and uh, we're getting to the end here, so I'll try to keep things lively and quick. Um, I wanted to, to start by reiterating uh, what's been said before, which is um, I'd really like to thank uh, Jimmy and, and everyone who's worked uh, to, to organize this conference. This is uh, much bigger than in the past, and it's really awesome to see so many people turning out and to see how vibrant the community is here in, in uh, KL and Malaysia. So uh, thank you very much, Jimmy, for all your hard work. So, uh, yeah, my name is Nick. Uh, I'm an American. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Rapid River Software, uh, which is based in Kuala Lumpur. We're a consultancy. And um, oops, I, I, I'm on GitHub. I'm Nick Martin. Uh, I'm some guy from the US. Uh, I've been a web developer since 1993, which makes me pretty much almost as old as every web developer uh, that could be. Uh, and uh, when I'm not writing software, my favorite thing to do is show other people things that I've learned about writing software. That's my son, Lucas. Uh, we're building a, a robot here. Um, and when I thought about the topic of uh, Unix and, and what Rubyus can use, use it for, I thought, what better way to, uh, to show these ideas than stealing Jimmy's money? Um, because you know, every, Jimmy is rolling in cash um, from, this, uh, from this conference. And you know, I think maybe we should just take a little back um, but Jimmy's got other ideas. He's, he's written a, a Ruby script and he's put it on a super secure server um, uh, on, a, on a private computer that we can't get to from the outside world. It's called the Vault is the name of the host. And, and in that script is his money. And so I've opened up, a, I did actually open up a competition. Um, and I don't know, I think about a dozen of you uh, participated. And I gave people access to this Bastion host. And uh, the job was to get Jimmy's money. So that's our agenda for today. And we're going to use Unix. So if you want to follow along, um, the actual repo for the code that we'll be discussing is uh, Nick Martin, steal Jimmy's money. And normally I'd say, like, I don't like to see everyone's laptop open while I'm talking. But please, open your laptop and take a look. Uh, this talk itself, in case you want to refer to it in the future, is uh, Unix for Rubyus. So. Jimmy's bank account. OK, so what we're going to see is we don't have access uh, to Jimmy's bank account. And it's got an in-memory combination that's combinatorically extremely diff impossible to guess. There's brute force protection built into his bank. Um, so we don't, it's not easy to get the money out. But we have Unix. Uh, so we're going to steal some things here. This, this is Steely from Rick and Morty. He's going to be our guy. Um, before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about Unix, because I think for some of you, this is old hat, and you're going to know everything I talk about in this talk. And some of you, Unix just happens to be the place where your stuff runs in production, and you don't really know that much about it, because you kind of live in your IDE. But um, Unix is a, an operating system that's been around since 1969. It was created at Bell Labs uh, in New Jersey. And also at Bell Labs in New Jersey is where the first ever field effect transistor was created. An interesting thing to think about is that uh, Bertain and, and Bardeen uh, and, and Shockley created that transistor in 1947, and Unix was created 22 years later. Unix is almost 50 years old, which means the time from the first transistor, which is a bit janky looking and doesn't scale down very well, to Today, only one third of that time happened before Unix was created. And Unix is still with us today. Um, as an aside, by the way, this is my favorite tweet of all time. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, your code is not as hacky as you think, because a CPU is actually just a rock that's been tricked into thinking. Um, the old Unix uh, that was hand labeled by Ritchie and mailed out to universities, uh, AT&T SysV, is, is what we think of when we think of old Unix. And it got a big modern facelift in the early 1990s. It's got that awesome David Hasselhoff look now, uh, when Linux was created. And FreeBSD followed shortly thereafter. Um, and the BSD uh, family later included Darwin, which is probably on all your laptops. So. Unix as a concept has gone through these two versions, uh, two, two major sort of phases. Um, but it's conceptually the same thing that it was back in the day. I like to think of Unix as being like Yoda, right? 
Uh, Matt's pointed out in the talk he gave at, at Red Dot Ruby this year that very few projects survive 20 years. Unix has been around for almost 50 years in, in some incarnation or another, another. And it's sort of like Yoda in, um, in the Star Wars movies. At the beginning, you think, oh, that's kind of an old and scraggly looking guy, and he doesn't look like he can do that much. But you find out later that actually he's super smart and he can kick your ass. So that's actually what Unix is. So anyways, let's talk about how we're going to try and uh, pull off this hack. So we're going to talk about some Unix ideas and some Unix tools that everyone should know about. We're going to crack Jimmy's bank.rb script locally. We're going to figure out the exploits. We're going to get access to the vault, and then we're going to execute the solution on the vault. Now, it's not going to be a live demo because I'm going to save you guys the hassle, but we're going through all the steps of how you do it. So if you've got the script open, um, we'll look at the very first part of, of the bank.rb uh, asks uh, how much money you want to deposit. That's actually the key to the puzzle. You have to know what number Jimmy typed in. If you, if you get that answer, you've, you've cracked the, the, um, the bank. And in Ruby uh, idiom, I use a range, you know, 0 to 50. I pick five numbers that are random. It's like, a, it's like the draw of the lottery. And that's my combination. And I register a thing called a signal handler. Um, and the signal handler's reaction to the user one signal should be to print out the combination. So we're going to need the combination to unlock the bank. And the script is willing to give it to us. But the thing is that Jimmy started up his bank script and put it in the background and left the server. So we don't have his terminal. So printing out the combination isn't going to help us. This is a problem. You're a smart guy, Jimmy. Protecting your money. The next part of the script sets the combination pins. So there's a bank, right? So there's these, you have, to, you have a, a lock with tumbler pins, and you've got to get them in the right order. So the way, I, the way Jimmy chose to implement this is uh, it just creates uh, 50, well, 51, uh, 51 um, uh, FIFOs. They're just Unix sockets. They're, they're files on disk that, or they appear to be files on disk, but they can be written or um, read from by the bank process. And I actually, I fork off all these processes, and each one of them owns one of these FIFOs. And so the way that you press a pin, is you just write something to that FIFO. So there's 50, 51 files, you just pick one and you write to it. And that says you press that pin. Now the structure of this code, if you read it, uh, I'm using each with object, which is the most awesome thing. I am creating a hash. I start with an empty hash. And 51 times, I create a temporary file and get rid of it. So that's just a cheap way to generate a temporary file name. And I call fork. And fork is an important Unix concept that we're going to get into in a little bit. But I'm just creating a new child process. It belongs to, its parent is the bank script. And I tell that child process to print out in the PS in the process listing to print out which pin it is. We're going to need that later. I print out a little bit of helpful text to tell us what the name of the temp file is that we can write to to activate that, that combination. And then I just start listening on the FIFO. You write anything at all to the FIFO, and uh, that will, the process will exit, because the break inside of the loop statement ends the processing of the loop. The fork block exits, and under the uh, behaviors of uh, Ruby fork, that means the child process uh, will exit. Okay. And the last thing I do is in Unix fork, when you do a fork, you get two processes: the parent and the child. In the parent process, the return value of fork is the process ID of the child. So I store that in a hash, and I'm going to need that hash later to test the combinations. So that's pretty simple. What does it look like in real life? So Ruby, bank.rb. Uh, Jimmy, wow, so much. He's got 456 units of whatever currency it is that we're working with. And you type that in, and it prints out the combination. And it says, well, that's OK. If you ever forget this, you can just send, send a user one signal to this process. And then it starts listing out the files that represent the different pins. And so if I. I see the first number in the combination is 6. 
And if I echo foo, which is the only thing you should ever echo when you need to echo something, if I echo that word into that file, the bank script tells me that I've correctly correct the, pressed the first pin. If I echo foo into the file that represents pin number zero, well, zero isn't yet, it's not time to press zero yet, my next one should be 44. So zero is wrong, and so I get an error, and the bank crashes and swallows Jimmy's money, and he's kept it safe. So that's the idea. And this is what the implementation of that looks like uh, at the end of the script. This is, where, this is the whole script, we're done. I just do a loop, and I call wait PID, which is what the, the parent is waiting for the children to exit. The children will exit when you press the pin. And I call processes.delete. Everyone knows the fast way to get rid of something in a hash and find out the value is to take the re return value of, of delete, all in one line. And if you press the right thing, I tell you you press the right thing. If you press the wrong thing, I raise an error and we swallow, Jimmy, we swallow the money. So that's the whole script. Now, I actually opened this up as a competition, two people, and some people came, and they actually solved it, so there'll be prizes at the end. But a lot of people uh, struggled with various conceptual parts, and I want to step back and explain the ideas in Unix and how you apply them to get the solution to the problem. So a fundamental idea of Unix architecture is kernel space versus user space. I'm sure most people are familiar with this. So in user space, where your process runs, you might do things like ask what your PID is. Well, that requires a call to the kernel, and so we have what's called a system call, get PID. If you want to mess with a file, you have to open it. That requires a call to open, also a syscall. And there are parts of the kernel that deal with implementing on the kernel side all of this behavior. System calls do almost everything interesting in a program that you would care about. So it's really important to think about if you've got a problem you need to solve, you think what system calls are happening. Because if they aren't the ones I expect, that's probably the problem. Okay, one other thing about documentation, I use this all over the place in these, I keep putting numbers after things. Again, most people probably know this. These are man pages, man page, manual pages, as they uh, are known, have sections. And if it's got a one, it's a program that you could call, something you type at the command line. If it's got a two, it's a system call that you could invoke. And there are other sections, and you can generally, like a program like PS that does a process listing, you don't have to say man one PS, because there are no other PSs. But stat, for example, there's a stat program. You can run it at the command line. That's stat one. There's a stat syscall, which tells you about the details of a file and returns it in C code. That's stat two. So to be unambiguous, you can say man two stat. You're saying, I want the, I want the syscall, not the, not the program. So I'm going to use this terminology as I go through the other slides. And as a user of Unix, you should be thinking about uh, man pages anytime you get stuck. Just type man ps or whatever. Okay. So one other important concept is Unix philosophy. Um, this is, was summarized really well in this quote. Um, sort of the core idea of Unix is you should have a bunch of really small programs that do one thing well. That's kind of probably anathema to monolithic Rails app developers, but uh, you do one thing well, and you write them to work together. And at the time when Unix was created, the universal interface, interface of data from one program to another was text streams. So programs like grep and awk and sed and all that, all they do is they take in data, they do something to it, and they spit it back out. Uh, a functional programmer would love that, right? Because the stream uh, is just an, a thing that gets passed through every function. So in keeping with that concept, Unix has the idea of standard file handles. There are three of them. They're numbered 0, 1, and 2. Every program has its standard input, its file handle 0. It has its standard output, which means things you would want to get out of the program if things are working well. And every program has its standard error, which is things you'd want to get out of the program if things aren't working well. In this example, I run my program, and I take its standard error, file handle 2, and I send it to dev null. I don't want to know about it. And then with the pipe symbol, I take that standard output, 
and I make it the standard input of grep. So that becomes file handle zero of grep. I get rid of grep dash v, means don't show me the lines that match this thing. I grep out the useless junk, and then its output, its file handle one, pipe, becomes file handle zero of the T program. And T is named T because it's like a plumber's T. It takes the output and it puts it in a file and it also prints it to the terminal. Literally plumbing. So those are the concepts I wanted to review. Now in Ruby, what does that look like? Well, if you ask Ruby, um, I've created a little function here called finfo. It's the file info. If I ask Ruby for the finfo about standard in, standard out, standard error, it is sure enough it tells me that the file handle numbers are 0, 1, and 2. Ruby is very heavily influenced by Unix philosophy, so this makes sense. But if I open other types of files, for example, if I use the open URI module and open up the FML subreddit, <coughs> then that's a temp file. It's still got a file handle number, it's number 9, but it's a temp file. Um, Etsy password's a regular file. And then interesting thing that we're going to use later on, if I close a file and open a new one, I reuse the file handle number. And that's an interesting trick that we use later. So it, it's a, there's a, a list, and when you close it, it leaves a hole. The next time an open happens, it uses that empty number in the list. Ruby's sort of standard files are named standard in, standard out, standard error. You can also use the dollar sign version of it. They're mutable. You can reassign them. This is a pretty awesome trick. You can actually just say, yeah, I want standard out to actually be this file over here. So this example shows that. Standard output to one file, standard error to another. Lastly, there's processes. Now, processes do everything in Unix. The kernel is there to offer its help, but the processes do everything. Every process has a numeric ID. You can find out about it from process.pid or just dollar sign, dollar sign, which is part of the great legacy of Perl magic variables. Um, that always send you to a man page to figure out what they are. And every process has a parent. The only process for it that's not true is this one process on your system called systemd or init. It's got process id1 because it's the one that gets started by the kernel. And it starts everything else. Okay, so we've, I've just reviewed a bunch of basic concepts. Probably all, you guys all know that stuff. Step number one, let's get the combination. We're going to use ps and we're going to use kill. PS is going to tell us uh, where the bank process is, and kill is going to help us get the combination. Now, kill is a funny name, because when, when you say kill a process, you think, oh, I'm going to kill it. Well, that's not actually the only thing it does. You can give any signal name to kill, and it will just send that signal to the process. Up to the process what it wants to do. So we're going to send a user1 signal to the bank. We did a little PS here. We use some pipes. We find out that the PID is 6967, and we send a kill user 1 to it. And nothing happens. Right? Because we don't own the terminal where this process is running. So it got printed somewhere, but we can't see the answer. So that was actually pretty useless. OK. Hmm, system call. Well, it turns out there's this really awesome tool that every single developer should know inside and out. It's called strace. Strace lists system calls as they occur in a process. You can say strace foo, and strace will start up foo and tell you what it's doing. Or you can say strace dash p and give it a pid, and it will attach to a running process and tell you what that uh, process is doing. And you can it gives you a lot of noise, so you can filter it further on system calls. Ltrace does the equivalent thing for user library calls, but the thing I said earlier is true. When a program's not doing what you expect, it's probably a system call that you wouldn't expect, and you want to go find out what that is. So let's attach to Jimmy's program. So 6967 is the PID, so strace-p, and I tell it, I only want to see times when the write function is called. Write is a system call whose job is to write to output file handles or disk files or whatever. So here we see that after we sent the sig user 1, that file handle 1 was told to write these characters. Well, that's it. We've got our combination. We just used strace. Now, this is obviously a completely contrived example, but I think you can all now think of cases where if you're ever stuck on something on a production server, this would have been a great way to find out what was going on if you have no other output. Okay, so that was step number one. 
Step number two is to enter the combination into the program. Ah, PS again, okay. So we PS, grep for the word bank. These are all our bank pins. That's awesome. We know the process IDs. Hmm. Here's an interesting program. List of open files, LSOF. This is the other thing you're going to use all of the time with strace. You, since everything in Unix is a file, knowing which files the program's interacting with or not interacting with is a great way to diagnose issues. So in this case, I, I wanted to enter combination zero. That's the first number in my example. So I find bank pin zero is 6970, and I run LSOF on it. And it has a FIFO open. That's the name of it. Now, I could have known this by looking at the screen that where Jimmy ran the bank, but I don't have that screen. So this gives me the information that I needed that was lost from his terminal. So again, I think everyone can imagine places where you might use this in a production server situation. So I correctly echo foo into that file, and the zero combination uh, gets entered. Blah, 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 I do all five, so on and so on. Now, let's, we lost Jimmy's terminal because he ran his bank script and you know, ran it under screen, or he, he logged out, or whatever. You know, it's in the background. We don't have access to it. If you want to use the sort of, <clears throat> when I was a kid, there was this awesome game called Wizardry. And uh, it was sort of like Dungeons and Dragons for the Apple II. And uh, there was just one spell. If you got powerful enough, it was called tilt -a -weight. And tilt -a -weight just destroyed everything. Um, the equivalent is GDB. <laughs> It's the tilt weight of debugging tools. Because this allows you to actually attach to the running process, which remember, Ruby is a C, it's C code, it's, right, it's got object files, it's got functions they got called. You can actually attach to it and inspect uh, variables, and you can also call C functions in the running program. So if you want to like really impress people at a party, um, pull out GDB and attach to the process, and close the file handle, OK? What I did here is I want to get back Jimmy's terminal. So I find out what TTY, what teletypewriter, what virtual terminal I'm attached to. It's dev PTS4. And I say, you know what? Forget Jimmy's standard out. I'm Jimmy's standard out. You close file handle number one. And do you remember we talked about how file handles automatically fill back in? Well, now the first open available slot in Jimmy's process here is file handle number one. So when I call open, now, I, my dev PTS4 now has all of Jimmy's standard out. And so when I issue that same command from the previous slide, the output comes here. Now you go through the five pins, and Jimmy's money dumps out onto the screen, and it's awesome. His bank account is empty. You got it all. Let's go drinking. So OK, that's great, except you're not on the server where it's running. So let's talk a little bit more about some concepts uh, that affect security a lot, but also have to do with sort of the heart of how Unix sees process management. Process forking. I used fork earlier. I just took for granted that everyone knew what fork was. But there's some key ideas about fork that uh, they're very simple, but you've got to really understand them. Everything in Unix starts with fork. The only program that ever gets run by the kernel is init. From that point forward, fork is doing everything. So the, the tree is literally a tree, and it all comes from init. And the parent and child, when you call fork, are almost identical things. So you just, uh, you've, uh, Aaron, you talked about the copy on write uh, issues. There's some simulation going on to make it be quick, but there's a complete copy of the memory. There's a complete copy of the file handles. A whole bunch of stuff is exactly identical. There's a few things that are different that you can read the man page about, but basically they're totally, totally exact copies. The only difference is that the parent sees a return value, a non-zero return value. That's an indication that you're the parent. If you're, if you're in the code, you're like, well, who am I? Um, because it's not like when you have a child, you're pretty aware at the end of the process whether or not you're the parent or the child. Um, I've seen the process, and it was very obvious at the end. Um, but in this case, since the processes are identical, um, how would you know? So you need the return value of fork to tell you that. And then uh, further proving that the, uh, 
the designers of Unix nailed the metaphor, um, the parent does have to clean up after the child. Um, and the way that the parent does that is they call one of the variants of the wait to system call. And um, in doing that, the parent then finds out like whether, if the child exited correctly and cleans up various uh, resources. Okay. So that's how process forking works. Um, since this is a Ruby conference, I just Ruby mumble mumble, I should probably talk about some actual Ruby stuff. Um, because of the way that fork works, um, because the memory is all copied completely, as, uh, as Aaron did allude to in his talk uh, in Singapore, um, of course you want to try to maximize the compilation before fork, right? Because you're going to get the, the fact that all these classes are already compiled is automatically true in, in the child process as well. So, I don't know if I got this exactly right, but the, the general thought that I've read about uh, is you want eager load paths um, to be maximal so that as many classes as possible are loaded uh, in Rails um, before the forking occurs. And of course, in any non-development environment, config cache classes is already going to be true. But that's an important part of it, right? Because um, otherwise, you, you would load all the classes, and then on the first request, you would dump the, the cache. Uh, that would be useless. Um, so an example would be something like a uni Unigram web server pool. You can load up all of your, your uh, active record models and all that stuff ahead of time. And then the children, when they fork, they, they're already good to go. They don't have to recompile in every child. OK. There's my requisite actual Ruby discussion. OK, so fork exec is a pattern that we see all the time. And it basically goes like this. So uh, you've got a process. It's going to start some other process a different process. So it calls fork, gets a new process, but it's a copy of myself, so that's not very useful. And then you call a second system call, exec. All exec does is just say, you know what? Don't run this code. Run that code. And so you have the same file handles that you had before, but you have a different binary image. So what you get is all of the environment and file handles from the parent running a different program. And there are lots of variations of this. If you could read the man page, um, it's kind of boring what, how they all differ. But uh, this is how every daemon, the SSHD and you know, HTTP, this is how they all work. Uh, well, no, HTTP doesn't, but the scripts that start HTTP. Um, so a pattern that you see is fork exec as enhancement. So what that means is, this is like a, a bin stub works this way. Well, not the, the bin stubs that are written in pure Ruby, but if something is a bin stub or a shim, you, you take a script, you add some behaviors that you want to the environment, and then you exec into a different program. And so what happens is you basically have enhanced that program by giving it some behaviors that it didn't have before. Okay? When you call exec in bash, there is no bash program anymore. You can try this. You can go to your console and type like, uh, I don't know, exec, whatever program you want to run. The bash shell script, the, the bash, sorry, the bash session doesn't exist anymore. Okay? So this fork exec as enhancement is a pattern that you see all the time. And I'm going to come back to that in just one second because it's really important in the technique we're going to use to hack into Jimmy's server. OK, one last thing is there's this concept of interprocess communication. Again, in the script, I took it for granted that you could make a FIFO. But what are these things? Well, you've got the idea of pipes. Well, we saw those um, in my example of you know, grep and, and T and all that. A pipe is just a unidirectional um, file handle. So one process can write to the pipe, and one can read from it. And then you have this idea of Unix sockets. Um, it's basically a bidirectional. Um, pipe, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, parent and child communication uh, is done with this, uh, with Unix sockets. Uh, communication between processes. Um, when you connect to like Postgres, you, know, you say PSQL and you hit return. If you're doing that on your local host, there's a socket file somewhere. It's a Unix domain socket. And your PSQL program is writing into that, and the Postgres server is writing back answers, and you're all you know, reading from each other. So. This IPC, as we call it, interprocess communication, has representations in Ruby that you can play with. It's really awesome. But uh, the, the important programs on your Unix box are using the heck out of these things in a way that we're about to see an example of. Um, last thing is, everyone should know um, permissions. Uh, we have this sort of uh, 
we have, we have file permissions, so there's that weird list of dashes and R's and W's and stuff. Um, the first, the very first character there tells you about the file. I, there's a lot of different things that can be there, D for a directory and S for set UID bit, blah, blah, blah. The next three say, what can the owner of this file do? So the owner is Nick. He can read and write this file. He can't execute it because it's not a pro program, it's just a file. Anyone in the group staff can read the file, R, dash, dash, but they can't write it or execute it. And the same thing for anybody in the world group. Now, one special rule is that root isn't bound by any of this. Root can do anything they want to any file at any time. So there you have it. Um, there are programs, if you, oh, look, a new man section, five. There's uh, POSIX ACLs, or, um, including the set faculty program. You can actually say, instead of just a group level or just a world level, you can say, actually, Anton can read this file. And that's, that's an extended access control list. So man set faculty and learn about that if you want to. Um, but just to recap here, we've got process forking with enhancement, we've got inner process communication, and we've got permissions. Can anyone guess what program I'm about to talk about that uses all of these things extensively? Hmm. SSH agent, right. So how does SSH agent work? Well, here on, by the way, uh, attribution, um, this is from uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago, where my son goes. Um, I did not attribute them on the slide because I fi couldn't figure out how to do that in Rabbit, but I'm sending them tens of thousands of dollars over the next four years, so we're good. And I said it out loud. Um, so here on Jimmy's laptop at home, he, he started up an SSH agent and he loaded his keys into it, and his SSH program is communicating over Unix socket back and forth to the, to the SSH agent to provide the uh, authentication that he needs to get into what's labeled as remote one here. It's the bastion host, okay? Well, when he logs in, SSHD spawns off a shell. And not labeled on this diagram is it also creates an SSH authorization socket on that server. Then when he goes to SSH to what's labeled as remote two, which is the vault, the SSH invocation in his shell talks to the SSH authorization socket on the Bastion host, which talks to SSHD, which is, <clears throat> which is read by SSHD, which goes back through the TCP connection to SSH, which sends a request over the Unix socket to SSH agent, which says, yeah, I got some keys for you, here you go, sends them down the wire, all the way back over to the Bastion host, where the key uh, is sent over the wire to the, the vault to get in. So a lot of people, I, I set them up with this contest and they mailed me back and said, uh, I think I got everything working, but I don't have an account on the vault. <laughs> yes, exactly. You don't have an account on the vault, but Jimmy has an account on the vault. And so here's what things look like. Jimmy's at home. He's got his SSH auth sock. He's logged into Bastion. He's got a shell running. He's left it running there. And meanwhile, over here on the vault, there's just the SSH daemon and his bank script, there's no connection. Here's the exploit that gets you into the server. Now, the way I set this up for this, this contest, um, I actually deliberately set the permissions on Jimmy's authorization socket to be wide open. Anybody who logged into the server could uh, read and write to Jimmy's auth sock. And by doing that, their SSH program, by simply just saying export, and you're saying the environment variable export SSH auth sock equals that file, all of a sudden their SSH client had access to Jimmy's key. Not really Jimmy's key, by the way. <clears throat> I keep that somewhere else. Now this is just a demo, but root can always do this. So that's something to think about. If you're forwarding your SSH keys that means there's going to be an SSH auth sock file on the servers that you log into. And anyone with root access on that server can get access to all of the keys you have loaded back at home. How many people already knew that? Okay, good. I'm glad I taught you guys something. Oh, yeah. So 
Uh, don't do that. <laughs> it's dangerous. Um, so yeah, using this exploit, uh, when someone else logs in here, uh, connects to Jimmy's SSH auth sock, and boom, they're into the vault. And at that point, the rest of the exploit, the very simple exploit that we already showed, is very straightforward to execute. And if you use GDB, you get to even see the output. So that's how the hijack keys go down. Okay, so in summary, Unix is awesome, and it's Yoda. It's really important to understand Unix design and tools. You're, if you really get to know these tools, you'll find that you solve problems very quickly, especially in production environments. And lastly, agent forwarding is extremely risky. So evaluate your own environment and decide if it makes sense for you. Okay, so here's Steely. Um, I've got some winners uh, from the contest that was announced on Slack and, uh, and on Facebook. Um, and I'd like to call them up for uh, congratulations. Uh, first prize winner is Lincoln Lee. This was unbelievable. I put the contest out there, and uh, he solved it in less than 12 hours. So congratulations. You've earned every dime of it. <laughs> uh, next is uh, Faisal Zakaria. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, lastly, uh, Hassan and Ahmed. Congratulations. Thanks, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Um, that's, the, that's my talk. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I dazed off. Yep, any questions for Nick about Unix, security, SSH, agent, what not to do? No, yes, please. Alex, yeah, we, we made a deal in, in, in the break room. <laughs> awesome. uh, I can ask the question. Um, is there any book that you could recommend? I know there's one that's Unix for, Unix for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, it, it, it didn't cross my mind. Uh, there's a book by a guy named Jesse Stormier. Um, it's called... Uh, uh, intro uh, bear with me for a second. Um, uh, Jesse Stormier. Unix. Um, Working with Unix processes. Um, this is a fantastic book. It's all, all the, there we go, Unix, uh, working with Unix processes. It's all written uh, with Ruby examples. So uh, it's gonna teach you a lot of the concepts of Unix, but y if you're a Rubyist, it will be read very cleanly. It's not like reading the man pages can be very daunting, I think, for some people because you know, they aren't C programmers. That's a fantastic book. I think it's only available as an ebook. Um, it's like 35 bucks USD, so it's not super cheap. Um, but uh, I read it um, a couple months ago just to sort of review uh, some of these concepts, and I found it to be awesome. Awesome. Any more? Excuse me, did you raise your hands? No. Did you raise your hands? Okay, that's a no. That's, uh, go ahead, Yudis. Uh, that's a time to be on port 22. What's that? The SSH has to be on port 22? Um, doesn't have to be, no. When you run the SSH demon, you can choose which port it listens on. It's a convention that it listens on port 22. Um, one thing, though, is, uh, well, there's the rule about port numbers in Unix, which is that only root can ever bind to anything less than port 1024. Um, you'll want SSHD generally to run as root because it needs to be able to spawn a shell for any user who logs in. It is conceivable to run SSHD as a, as a single user, but that SSHD would only be able to spawn shells for that user. Um, but it doesn't have to be port 22. Um, and actually, uh, in terms of security, I'm not a security expert at all. Don't hire me to do your security if that's the only thing you're looking for. I do web development. But uh, moving stuff around to different ports is um, sort of a security um, uh, through obscurity trick. 
Um, the thing that I showed earlier, the bank vault pin combination, there is an, a, a networking equivalent of that called port knocking. Do people know what port knocking is? Anyone? Yeah. You basically require someone who wants to connect to try to connect to a series of ports in a well-defined sequence. And once they do that, then the IP tables or the IP firewall will then allow them to connect to the, the port that they actually want to connect to. So it's like the, right? And then you're allowed to connect to port 22. So um, you can move SSHD to a different port if you want security in that case, or you can implement tricks like SSH port knocking. Good question. I, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, one more. Just out of curiosity, when you first started your presentation, you opened your presentation using SH in terminal. So, like, I couldn't help but notice that you opened it that way. Oh, I'm just curious how. Oh, that's is that's that like Rabbit. A, um, is that like a program or something? Yeah, that's or? Rabbit. Uh, it is um, a uh, presentation tool written in Ruby, um, really uh, biased towards Ruby presentations, um, mm -hmm. and so the entire presentation was just a markdown file. So if you go to GitHub, Nick, uh, Nick Martin on GitHub, you'll actually see my whole presentation there, and the whole thing is just one markdown file and a, and a directory full of images. Um, I found Rabbit to be, it's the first time I used it, I found it to be a little bit confusing. Documentation is a little bit in Japanese. Um, I don't <laughs> speak any Japanese. Uh, I think that would be easier for some other people. Um, but as always, just walk through the source code and you can figure it out. There, was, there were some pry by bug sessions um, in my <laughs> presentation writing. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, actually, I, I, I want to be like Matt's. It's never going to happen, but like in one little way, I thought I would use his presentation tool, and I could like channel him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If that is all, please put your hands together. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you.